Hello. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Hi. How are you? Good, good, good. Hi. Hello. Hi there, Susie. Hi. Hi, Renee. Hey. Hey, Stephanie. Hello. Can't read your... Sorry, my... My, uh... My towel blew up on my phone here. I have a towel at the bottom of this phone to prevent the wind from hitting it. <laughs> uh, when I first started doing these walk talks last year, um, you know, I just held the phone up and walked and as, as I walked, the wind would just <laughs> So as I went back and listened to all these walk talks, I was like, how can I stop that wind? So I purchased a microphone, I had a little wind buffer on it and I've clipped it on there. That still didn't work. So I was like, what can I do to stop the wind? So I got the idea of just taking a hand towel, just my little running hand towel. I got one in this hand, one in this other hand, who I call cameraman number one. And I just got it cradled under the phone here. And I got like a little scoop at the bottom of it where um, the, my voice can still hit it, but you don't hear all the wind. So hopefully that helps. And sometimes this, towel on this phone gets out of control and I got to try to finagle it back in the middle of a walk talk and stop the wind and everything else <laughs> but uh yeah sometimes it goes up on the comments you know I try I try to pay attention to the comments and during the introduction but once I get started I don't even look at the comments so if you guys are asking questions or making statements during the lives I'm not ignoring you I'm just staying focused on the topic at hand so since we got a nice size audience here, let's go ahead and get started with today's walk talk. Today's walk talk is who will not inherit the kingdom of God? Who will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, before I get into that, first of all, I want to introduce myself. Just in case you're new to my ministry, <laughs> I get new people all the time, every day, and they want to know who are you and what do you do and A, B, and C. My name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. So far, I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Now, you can also find all of my walk talks on YouTube. If you want to go back and watch every single one, I think I'm up to 91 maybe, somewhere around there. Or you can download the podcast. All these walk talks are available on a podcast now. So your favorite podcasting app, just look up walk talks with Matt McMillan. And I've actually edited those to where you don't have to listen to me wait for people to join the room because this is live. So if you're listening to this in the future on the podcast, <laughs> you don't have to listen to this part. You're just going to skip right to where my introduction begins. But um, as far as the podcast is concerned, um, it is on every major platform. Now, here's the thing. Um, I just released it last Friday or I don't know, sometime last week. It's not on Spotify yet. Spotify takes time to populate. So if you have an Android and you only use Spotify, keep searching. Um, it'll be there any day. I've already checked with the podcast company that I use and they say it takes time for the podcast to populate there. Um, besides that, um, I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. And the word pastor is only used once in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter four. And we don't see anything listed as far as qualifications. We don't see anything listed as far as authority. What does that tell you? No pastor has any qualifications to do what they do <laughs> according to the Bible. Now that might rub somebody wrong. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just saying, go back to the Bible, <laughs> go back to scripture. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that gives a list of qualifications for a pastor. Okay, so when we look at the Bible, it's not there. We don't see it. Not only does it not list a pastor with qualifications, it also doesn't list any authority. It's absent from all biblical text. 
So what we have come up with today in our modern church on the Sundays, at the buildings, with the person up on stage, we have created that humanity because that's not in the Bible. Not one time in the Bible do we see one person up on stage telling everybody what to do, telling everybody what to think and giving their opinion. It's not there. Not one time in any New Testament letter do we see this happening. Instead, we see groups. We see bodies or smaller individual groups of the body of Christ. The churches is individual pockets of believers, but there's nothing in the Bible that says anything about a pastor leading us. It's not there. So why is this? Why'd this happen? Around the first or second century, somebody pulled the word pastor out of Ephesians chapter four, decided to turn it into what it is today ish. They put themselves in charge and they said, nobody can do anything unless I'm here. And then after that happened, they put other quote pastors in charge, pastors, put pastors, put pastors, put pastors in charge. And it snowballed into what it is today. But if we just go back to, back to the Bible, it is absent from the Bible. Why is this important? And why do I say this in my introduction? It's because I want you to be confident in who you are as a child of God, not in any individual person. Okay. We have to take our focus off of individual people. You have to take our focus off of individual buildings. Go back to what the Bible says. And you have all you need right now for life and godliness because the Holy Spirit lives in you. It's really that simple. He teaches you. Now, when you hear something from somebody else that agrees with him, he will agree with that. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to that. Okay? So, don't disrespect people who find their identity in the quote position of pastor. That's, that's never going to work. It doesn't help. I've tried it a lot. Don't attack that. You'll regret it. You'll burn bridges. You, it's not for you as a child of God. You want peace. You want love. You want to be patient with them. You want to be kind. So when somebody is struggling with the error of, you know, I'm a pastor, uh, listen to me. I know everything. Let them have that error, okay? That is their flavor of the flesh. That is what they are struggling with. And it has nothing to do with you. It's them. Let them have that error. Find some kind of commonality. Find some kind of kindness to build with them. Don't attack them. Sometimes this is not possible. Sometimes they, <laughs> they don't want nothing to do with you because you're threatening their identity because they find their identity in that position. But if they would just go back to the Bible, find the word pastor, study it, release themselves from that error, they can have that quote position in the church while knowing that I'm not, this is not what I am. I'm a child of God. Okay. Now, a couple of things in regard to the word pastor as well, which might've brought up some new thoughts. Um, the word bishop was replaced with elder. So we don't see the word bishop in any of the most up-to-date translations of any scripture. So we also see elder in scripture and we see deacon 70 to 80 times depending on the translation. But when we look at the words elders and deacons, that's listed more than a pastor. So if we're really, quote, wanting to put the right person in charge of a group, even though they're not in charge of a group, why not put an elder or a pastor in charge? It's referenced a lot more in the Bible. Do you see it? It's just compounded error. We see no person who is an elder in charge. We see no person who is a deacon in charge. We see qualifications. That's it. Qualifications, not authority. What does that mean? It means you're qualified to be a mature Christian within this group of Christians and people understand that you are qualified because you're mature in the faith. The word elder simply means somebody who is mature in a faith. There were elders who walked around with the Pharisees. There's elders in tribal religions. There's elders, you know, in pretty much every religion. Just because you're an elder does not mean you're in charge. Does not mean there's an elder board or a deacon board. Those things are absent from scripture. So let's get all this stuff off the table with the pastoral worship, the elder board, the deacon board, being afraid of people saying that somebody has authority over you. Nobody has authority over you. The last holdout on this would be somebody going over to Hebrews chapter 13 and saying, 
uh, right here, Hebrews chapter 13 says they have authority over you. Hebrews chapter 13 does not say anything about a pastor. This is written to the Hebrews, the Jews. The Jews didn't have a pastor. They had a temple with a Levitical priest. The Levitical priest did not preach. The Levitical priest did not say anything. They received your animal and then they went behind the curtain, spilled the blood and you received forgiveness for the past year. Okay, so the authority in the book of Hebrews is the message about Jesus. This pocket of Hebrew people had heard all about Jesus. Some of them said, no, they tasted, but they didn't swallow, they didn't drink in the rain. They didn't believe in the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. The once for all sacrifice of Jesus is the authority. This has nothing to do with the pastor. So context matters. It is the authority of Christ, the message about Christ that Hebrews 13 is referring to, not a pastor. So this should start renewing your mind to what we see today on planet earth in the buildings. Because at the buildings, what we see for an hour each week, that's not in the Bible. Am I against it? No. This is free thoughts, free. This is the freedom Christ died to set you free for. So when you hear free thoughts, when I preach freedom, people don't know how to compute that. So they attack me. <laughs> they say, I'm saying something when I'm not. For example, when I talk about pastors and I talk about the freedom we have from this pastoral worship error, and then I just point back to the Bible, people say, you're attacking pastors. I actually try to always put into my message, love them, don't attack. And then I try to let you know I've tried that. Don't attack, love them. Also, when I tell you you're not commanded to go to church, Hebrews 10.25 is not about going to church. Hebrews 10.25 is about gathering to discuss the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Read chapter 10, read nine and 10 together all the way up to Hebrews 10, 25. Matter of fact, Hebrews 10, 26 tells them to stop going to a building, the temple. There's no sacrifice left there. No more animal blood can forgive you. So if you keep going back to the temple, you're deliberately sinning according to the law of Moses. There's no sacrifice left for you. You have to believe in the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. If you don't, there's gonna be a fearful expectation of judgment and fire because you are trampling on the spirit of grace. Grace, these Hebrew people did not like grace. Grace is the opposite of law. They didn't like it. Hebrews is a book of law. Okay, so that's not thou shalt go to church. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? That's not church either. That was from Friday to Saturday. It was for the Jews. The law cannot be changed. So. If you're going to a building on a Sunday thinking you're keeping the Sabbath holy, you're actually not. Now we see in the book of Acts where the early group of Christians met on the first day of the week, but that was just for convenience purposes. They were not changing the law. Majority of these people were Jewish and they knew. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, do not add to, do not take away from the law. It's a package deal. That's why Paul said, you are cursed if you don't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So. You don't have to go to church, according to the Bible. If you want to go to church, you're free. Okay, now, so that is my introduction. And uh, if you wanna contact me, I know that some of the things that I say, people think I'm trying to shock you you know, I'm not trying to shock you. I'm not interested in shock value. I'm not interested in getting a bunch of views because something I'm saying is controversial. The gospel is extremely controversial and I have nothing to do with that. I am an ambassador for Christ. I'm going back to the Bible. I'm standing on what scripture says in context of what Christ has done. You do what you want to do with it. I know because Jesus is not a big deal in most of our churches, because most of our churches do not make a big deal about his blood, because our churches, most of our churches only look to Jesus as pretty much just a mascot behind their tradition. When I preach the gospel, it is shocking 
When I tell you you're forgiven once and for all time because of the blood of Jesus, that is shocking. When I tell you God will not repeatedly forgive you by asking, that is shocking. When I tell you you don't repeatedly repent to be repeatedly forgiven because that's a works-based righteousness and nobody has ever repented of sins in order to receive repeated forgiveness even before the cross, that's shocking. But this is all new covenant stuff. I'm standing on the truth of what Jesus has done for us at the cross, which is forgive us. To us at the resurrection, which is to give us new life. You know, people say, you got to give your life to Christ. You had no life to give him. You were born spiritually dead in your sins. The resurrection gave you life after the cross crucified you. Then... Christ wants to do things through you. So when I say you are one spirit with the Lord, that he's not far off, he's not up, he's not out, he's in, that's shocking. For you, forgave you at the cross. To you, caused you to become a brand new creation through the resurrection. And now through you, through your actions and attitudes, you are a branch. He is the vine. You don't produce fruit. You're not a fruit producer. You are a fruit bearer. Okay, all of these things, it's just the gospel. It's simplicity, but because it's not popular, because it doesn't sell, because it doesn't rake in the tithe, because it doesn't get people to obey a person, it's not popular. But just because something's not popular doesn't mean it's not the truth. Okay, now when I talk about this stuff, if you have new thoughts, new ideas, new questions, you can always Google me, Google the topic, Google the Bible verse. I've probably written about it or I've made a video on it. You can read that stuff for free and I welcome that. Go to my website, go to my YouTube, go to my podcast, or you can email me. Go to my website, go over to the contact page, Fill out the contact information with whatever your question is. And if you are civil, I will interact with you. I welcome that. I'm not unreachable. Okay? Reach out. Now, let's go ahead and get into today's walk talk. <laughs> now, um, typically when I do a walk talk, it is because I am seeing or hearing something uh, ad nauseum a lot and what I've been seeing recently on social media is who will not inherit the kingdom of God so the title of this walk talk is who will not inherit the kingdom of God there are different opinions on this but when we understand the proper context of the passage from 1st Corinthians 6 and then Galatians 5 it makes sense when we don't understand the context, it doesn't make sense, it's confusing, and it's scary. So who will not inherit the kingdom of God? First of all, let's do some 101 stuff about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Is it when you die, you enter into this amazing kingdom, and you get to see all your relatives, all the patriarchs of the faith, you know, you can, you can give Adam and Eve a tongue lashing, you can... You can ask Paul some questions of why'd you say this? You can ask, Jack. you enter into the kingdom of God? Is that heaven? Sure, of course. But even deeper, the true kingdom of God is Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. I'm gonna pause. So you can digest that for just a moment. Jesus is the kingdom. The kingdom is Jesus. Do this. And I always invite you to do this. Go back to the Bible. I use a website called Bible Gateway. You've seen it if you've Googled any type of Bible verse. Go to Bible Gateway. Type in the kingdom or type in kingdom or type in kingdom of God. 80 to 90% of those verses on this side of the cross are referring to Jesus. Some of them aren't but the majority of them are referring to Jesus. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he was saying, I am the kingdom. You're gonna miss out because you refuse to believe in me by grace. 
Jesus is the kingdom of God. So go read the passages in the Gospels where Jesus talks about the kingdom and he is typically referring to himself. All right. So Jesus is the kingdom of God. When we understand that Jesus is the kingdom of God, the verses about those who won't inherit the kingdom of God start to make a little bit more sense. So let's look at the two primary passages where people will go back to the Bible and say, right there, you will not inherit the kingdom of God because you are doing something. Do you see it? They have the do mixed up with the who. They have the actions and attitudes mixed up with the identity. Both passages, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, and Galatians 5, verse 20 and 21, that is a descriptive passage of identity. It is not prescriptive. It is not saying do this and then. Both times, Paul is describing who will not inherit Christ, the kingdom of God. Because of their identity, not because they are doing these things, but because they have a natural practice of doing those because their identity is not regenerate. He is describing their old nature. He is describing the old person that they used to be. So let's look at those passages. Let's start out in 1 Corinthians 6. We see in verses 9 and 10, it's a laundry list of sins. I'm not even going to listen. Go go read them for yourself. And some people will cherry pick out of this list. That's a whole nother walk talk right there. And they'll point out one sin or two sins, but then they'll ignore the other sins because they're struggling with that and they ain't going to talk about that. That's a different walk talk. Let's not do that today because that will get me going. I'm getting a little triggered just thinking about that. But the... Who is Paul writing to here? The Corinthians. Now keep in mind, this is written to Christians in Corinth. What's Corinth? It's a Greek city. What were the Greeks doing? Lots of stuff (laughs) that are not natural for a child of God. Lots of stuff. Lots of outward looking sin. And there's some inward looking sin inside the mind of somebody in that passage as well. But Paul is telling them who they used to be. You used to practice these things and you know that whoever practices those things naturally from the heart will not inherit Jesus, has not inherited Jesus, has not inherited even the kingdom to come later on whenever we do go to heaven. This is a descriptive passage of identity. This is not Paul saying, you're doing a bunch of sinning, therefore you're not going to heaven. No, remember the kingdom of God is Jesus. Why do I say that with such blatant confidence? Read the next verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And you were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified. You were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. He's saying, that's not you guys. Don't walk that way. And then he continues, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Honor God. You house the Holy Spirit. You were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified past tense by Jesus. And through the Holy Spirit. Or through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. We can't go to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10 and say, these people aren't going to go to heaven because they're sinning. That's not the context. The context is identity. Paul is saying, that is what you were. Read the next verse. And they keep reading. You were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified. That's not who you are. Does he ever say, That stuff will get you unsaved. That stuff will stop God from doling out a bunch of stuff in heaven. Uh, You're going to get a less reward in heaven. Uh, You this, you this, you that. Never threatens them. 
You notice that? Anytime Paul corrects somebody about behavior, he goes back to identity, never threatens them. And then he reminds them who they are. You were washed. Don't do that. You were justified. Don't do that. You were sanctified. Don't do that. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you see it? Identity. An improper teaching of this section of scripture is getting up on stage and the world is doing all this nasty sinning. They ain't going to heaven. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whatever. You've all heard it. You've all seen it. Error. Okay. Now, let's go on. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This is a, you know, Galatians chapter 5 is something else. It is something to behold. If there is one chapter in the Bible that is misread or is read improperly or from the wrong view, it's probably... Galatians chapter 5. And why? Why is this? It's because there's some words in Galatians chapter 5 that people don't understand. And they are the flesh. I'm going to come back to that. But what is Galatians chapter 5 about? Now keep in mind, Paul didn't write this letter to the Galatians in chapters. It's all one letter. We added chapters later in verses for easy referencing. And because those chapters and verses were added, we have the tendency to go to a specific chapter, pull it out, or even worse, pull a verse out and make a theology on it. But we have to make a theology on the book of Galatians from the whole letter. Not just Galatians 5, not just Galatians 5, 20 and 21, but the whole letter. That's where we have to build up our theology. But let's, from Galatians, but let's just, let's go to chapter 5, where it's referenced to chapter 5. Chapter 5 starts out saying... It was for freedom that Christ died. Don't allow yourself to be yoked again by the bondage of slavery. What is this talking about? Is it talking about the slavery from America in the 1800s? No. Has nothing to do with that type of slavery. Is it talking about uh, drinking, smoking, cussing, going back to the streets, doing all the bad stuff again, you relapsed? Nope. That's not what the bondage is. The true context of Galatians chapter 5 is the law. The law. The law of Moses. That's why he mentions circumcision. He says circumcision is of no value. Circumcision is part of the law. It's one of the 613. Circumcision is Judaism. So why did he say that? He doesn't want you to go back to the law. Paul had established this group of Christians in Galatia. Didn't preach anything about Moses. Didn't teach any of the Ten Commandments. Didn't teach any of the 613. And he knew all of them. He was a Jew among Jew. He was a from the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> he was a huge persecutor of the church in the opposite way for a long time. So Paul understood the law. But when he went to Galatia, he did not preach the law. He preached Jesus. What happened? So why would he say, stand firm? You were running a good race. You were doing a great job. The Judaizers, the Jews, came in behind Paul and said, yeah, Jesus is great, but you still need the law. You need to add a little bit of law in with it, then you'll really complete it. That's why Paul publicly calls out Peter in the beginning, chastises him to his face in front of everybody and said, why are you putting this burden on these Gentiles when you yourself couldn't even live up to the law? Peter, you know, the rock, quote, the rock. Oh my gosh, I love Peter, (laughs) but (laughs) Peter is not the rock. It is the message that Peter had just agreed with. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, my opinion is, and you could take this or leave it, I think Peter killed him. In Acts chapter five, because God doesn't kill people for lying about money. But then we have Peter, who also cut off the guy's ear when they were trying to arrest Jesus. And then we have Peter here in Galatia, refusing to eat with the Gentiles because the Jews came into town. And then Paul had to stand up and publicly rebuke Peter. Why are you putting the law back on these Gentiles? You yourself couldn't even live up to the law. What is the, what is the matter with you? What's wrong with you? 
It was for freedom that Christ died. Don't allow yourself to be yoked again to this bondage of slavery. And you Gentiles didn't even have the law to begin with. You're reading somebody else's mail. You weren't part of that covenant. It's not for you. And then he says, circumcision is of no value. And then he says, you foolish Galatians, you're fools because you're trying to obey the law with the gospel. Okay, so Galatians chapter five is about the law. It is about mixing in a little bit of yeast in with the dough. It leavens the whole lump. You cannot put old wine in a new wine skins, it'll burst. A great divorce must happen between you and the law of Moses. First of all, if you're not Jewish, you weren't even allowed to follow the law. <laughs> it's not for you. You're a Gentile. <laughs> but if you are a Jew, the entire book of Hebrews is written to you. Repent. The Messiah has come. It is Jesus. Stop wailing at a wall. You're in limbo right now because you refuse to believe that Messiah is Christ. Believe. There's no law in with the gospel. None. James, the half brother of Jesus said, you are cursed if you don't keep, or you, you break every command if you break one command. Not just one of the top 10, the quote top 10, because there is no top 10. It's 613 or bust. He said, if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. And then Paul says in Galatians chapter three, you're cursed if you don't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. It's a joke. It's a joke if you think you can follow the law for righteousness, any part of it. Yeah, but we got to have the law for morality. You do not. No part of the law is of faith. Romans chapter 6 says, Sin will no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Romans chapter 10, Christ is the end of the law for everyone who will believe. It has not been abolished. If you want to follow it, have at it. Go, go follow it. But Jesus said, be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect if you want to follow the law. And if you don't, cut off your eye, cut off your hand, pluck out your eyes, sell everything. Someone smacks you on the cheek, turn your other cheek, let them hit the other cheek. Don't expect any return when you loan somebody money. These are the standards of the law. Perfection. The law is not of faith. The law was brought in to reveal your need for grace. So it is still available. But if you want to teach it, Paul told Timothy, you don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. The law is not for the righteous. You are righteous. There's not one righteous, McMillan. I know, unbelievers. I know, those who look to the law for righteousness. Keep reading. We are righteous because of Christ. Stop confusing unbelievers with believers. Stop applying Bible verses describing the identity of an unbeliever to a believer. When you go through the Bible, if you see anything about anybody who's unrighteous, it is not describing a Christian, not once. We are righteous, period, because of Christ. Deal with it. If you're a Christian, deal with your righteousness. I ain't talking about what you do, I'm talking about who you are. And if you wanna mix in a little bit of law with grace, good luck. Or, let's get back to friendly, Matt. <laughs> or you can repent. You can repent towards grace. <laughs> Uh, sometimes my, I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to continue. Uh, <laughs> all right. Galatians chapter five, verse 21 says those who practice acts of the flesh, acts of the flesh, acts of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, now, in the context of Galatians chapter 5, practicing acts of the flesh would be practicing acts of the law. That's why Galatians 5.23 says, Against such things there is no law. How many places today, it's Sunday today, if you're listening to this on a podcast in the future, today's Sunday. How many places today on this planet is somebody up on stage using Galatians 5.21 as a way to point out the sin of the world. Lots, I'm sure. Out of context. Because Galatians 5.21 is about the Judaizers. It is about those who refuse grace. 
And as you can see, lots of bad stuff happens. This has nothing to do with the Christian's actions and attitudes. This has nothing to do with your struggle. This has to do with acts of the flesh, which are stirred up by Judaism. And Paul, if you want to really see how Judaism affects a person, read Romans chapter 7. Paul describes his past life in a first person story of his inability to live up to the law and the flesh that was stirred up. Now, let's talk about the flesh for a moment. Oh, I really wish there was a different word for this in English, <laughs> but, but God set it up this way. It's just so frustrating to explain what the flesh is so much. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. Well, let's just do it. Let's just keep going with it because I got it. I'm going to have to do this till the day I die. Explain what the flesh is. The flesh is not your body, your flesh. The flesh is not you. Okay. This is hard to understand. The Greek word for the flesh, when you put that little T-H-E in front of the word flesh, it changes the meaning. Anytime you see the and then flesh, rule of thumb, that's not talking about my body. That is an it. That's why all through Galatians chapter five, we, you see with the flesh and its desires, with the flesh and its passions, the spirit and the flesh are at battle with each other. The flesh is an it. The Greek word for the flesh is sarx, S-A-R-X. When we look at the Greek word of sarx, it is not talking about your physical body. It is not your body. It is not your flesh. It, the word sarx does not mean sinful. The word sarx does not mean nature. The word sarx does not mean your body. It is a separate entity altogether. It is an it. That's why Paul says its passions and its desires. And as you can see in Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Some people go to Galatians 5.24 and say, I gotta crucify my flesh. That's not your flesh. That's not your flesh. Your flesh is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 3, 6 says, you are the house of God. Why would you want to crucify the temple of the Holy Spirit? Why would you want to crucify the house of God? Paul told the Ephesians, you care for your body like Christ cares for the church. You don't crucify it. Galatians 5, 24 says, the flesh with its passions, its desires, as you can see, it is an it. So go back to Galatians 5, read it. Every time you see the word, the flesh, Understand, it is a separate entity altogether. It is worldly ways of getting your needs met. It is something you have died to. You've died to that power, that principle, that force. You've been taken out of the realm of the flesh, placed into the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. You are not in the flesh. You have flesh, but you are not in the flesh. That's the difference. That's why Galatians 5.25 says, since you live by the Spirit, walk in step with the Spirit. Again, identity. Identity. Since you belong to Christ, you have crucified the flesh with its passions, its desires. Since you live by the Spirit, now walk that way. Paul is saying this fits you best. What fits you best? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That's what fits you. Against such things, there is no law. You cannot legislate the fruit of the spirit by saying thou shalt. That's why Judaism has to be gone. Boop. So when you read those, read about those who will not inherit the kingdom of God in Galatians chapter five, that is the Jews who were pushing the law onto the Galatians. And what happened? Acts of the flesh were stirred up. And then you got all this laundry list of acts of the flesh where 
you're gonna be walking according to something that you are not. Can you walk as if you are in the flesh? Can you walk that way? Yeah, but it's an act. It's not who you are. You were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. You are a brand new creation. That stuff will never set right with you. You can, you can walk that out all you want, but you might as well walk in step with the spirit because that is who you are. You have crucified the flesh with its passions, its desires. You did not crucify your body. You're fully alive. You're watching this live. You're listening. You're looking at it on YouTube. Your, cru your flesh is not crucified. You don't harm your flesh. It is it, it, it. So a rule of thumb when you see the words the flesh, just know that it's not talking about you. It's not talking about your body. You know, unfortunately, the NIV translation, when it first came out in the early 80s, they translated the words the flesh to sinful nature. Oh my gosh, the crap hit the fan there. Now everybody who was reading this very popular Bible thought that they had a sinful nature because they started reading the words the flesh as sinful nature. And then they thought there was something wrong with their nature. You don't have a sinful nature. The words sinful nature are not in the Bible. Now, did you have a sinful nature before salvation? Yes, naturally. You were born central, sinful because of Adam. But you still did not see the words sinful nature in the Bible. And the context of every place where they put sinful nature is wrong. That's why the NIV actually changed it back to the flesh. And they just let it be. Figure it out. Figure out what the flesh means. There's no English translation which can express sarks natural in in a in a clear way you know i don't know i don't know why god allowed this to happen uh, because it's super annoying but it is what it is you don't have a sinful nature the word sinful nature are not in the bible when sinful nature was in the bible they've changed it back so if you have a bible that says sinful nature rather than the flesh in Galatians chapter five, you can actually go back and mark through all those and you can write in the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, not your flesh, but the flesh because they have changed it back. The most updated translations of the NIV have changed sinful nature back to the flesh. Why? Because you don't have a sinful nature. So this makes it even more confusing than just calling it the flesh. We just need people to explain what the flesh is. <laughs> the flesh is not you. There's nothing wrong with your body. First Thessalonians five says all three parts of you are blameless, spirit, soul, and body. <sighs> you know, and I saw a TikTok which was one of the things that made me want to talk about this after I've seen other things about who will not inherit the kingdom. This guy had a TikTok that had like, I don't know, a million views maybe. And his brother had just overdosed. And he gets on there and he says, I want to help people. If there's one thing that I can do is get on here on TikTok and, and help people so they don't do the same thing that my brother did in overdose. And he went to Galatians 5 and he said his brother was doing all these things according to his flesh. And I was like, oh, it was really sad. And then he put a bunch of pressure on people. His brother had that same pressure put on him. And do you see what happens when you get pressure put on you? It's hopeless. It's hopeless. But when you remove the pressure and you, and you know, if you have a relative who's struggling with a, an addiction, you don't want to tell them, stop giving into your flesh. There's nothing wrong with your flesh. You, your flesh has physical desires. Your flesh has a desire to eat. Your flesh has a desire to sleep. Your flesh has a desire to have orgasms. Your flesh has a desire for Lots of stuff. There's nothing wrong with your flesh. Your flesh is an instrument, Paul said. And you could use that instrument however you like. We, because we are holy, we are to use our instruments for righteousness because that makes sense. Because we live by the spirit and we have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So we don't need to tell people, stop giving into your desires of your flesh. A better thing would be to say is take those desires to God. God knows you have physical desires. God knows you want to have sex. 
God knows you want to feel good. God knows that you want to eat. You don't have to binge eat. You don't have to overeat. You don't have to sleep with a bunch of people. You don't have to get high. You don't have to, you know, get drunk. You, you are free. God knows what you want. But we don't have to say there's something wrong with your flesh. We need to tell people about the grace of God because Paul told Titus, it is the grace of God which will lead you into living an upright, holy, self-controlled life. Grace, not law, not confusing your flesh with the flesh, not saying you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because of your struggle. We need to tell people, you're righteous, you're holy, you're blameless, you're a new creation, you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified, there's nothing wrong with you, you're a new creation, your body is a beautiful instrument, God can help you with this, there's nothing wrong with you, encourage them, if they have believed, if they haven't believed, point them to how they can be saved. That is who will not inherit the kingdom of God. So to answer who will not inherit the kingdom of God, the title of this walk talk, unbelievers. Those who have a natural practice, a natural tendency to express the deeds of the flesh. Those who have not been washed, those who have not been justified, those who have not been sanctified. And who is that? It's those who say, nope, Jesus is not the Messiah. I do not believe by grace. That is who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unbelievers, not Christians who are struggling. Sometimes you struggle for so long. You've been in denial about your struggle for so long. You have trained your conscience to be desensitized to it, but you still know in here. The Holy Spirit bears witness to you. And he's faithless even when you're faith he's faithful even when you're faithless. Whatever you struggle with, you don't have to worry about not inheriting the kingdom. You have already inherited Jesus. He already lives in you. You don't have a practice of sin. You have a practice of righteousness. You don't partake in the deeds of the flesh. You have died to the flesh. <laughs> You belong to Jesus. You have crucified the flesh. You're not crucifying the flesh again and again and again. You don't even fight the flesh. When you read Galatians chapter five, you are never instructed to fight the flesh. When you try to get in that fight between the flesh and the spirit, then you don't do what you want to do. Read it, read it again. Read it with the new covenant lens on. Understand what the flesh is. Understand who you are. Understand your identity. Understand that you already have inherited everything for life and godliness. You have nothing to fear in regard to any passage in the Bible, much less 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5. So, so I hope this has encouraged you guys today. I hope it's brought to light some error you might have been struggling with. And, you know, it's, the gospel means good news for a reason. You don't start by grace and then go back to the law. If Paul was around, he'd say, that's foolish. You don't start by grace and then go into self-effort. You know, if, if, if Paul was around, he would say, that is of no value. You get So I think, can you hear me now? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yes. I'm guessing yes. I'm going to go ahead and continue. I hit a button and it said muted. So anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome.
I was finishing up anyway. <laughs> this is the end of my walk talk. So it was super windy today. I try to all throughout my walk talk, um, fix this towel on the bottom so you guys can hear me clearly. But you know, if you want to go back and watch this walk talk, if you missed any of it, it's going to be available. I'm having connection issues. If you want to go back and watch this, this walk talk, if you joined late, I will post it to my Instagram profile as soon as I get off here. Just give me a few minutes, but you can also go to YouTube. This will be on YouTube later today. Um, just search Matt McMillan Ministries on YouTube. You can actually watch all of my walk talks or you can download the podcast and you can have it in your pocket and listen to it while you work out, do the dishes, uh, on your drive, whatever. Um, and it's called walk talks with Matt McMillan and it is now available on podcast. So be, be sure to download that. So, all right guys. So always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. You're set apart. There's nothing wrong with you. And you are awesome. Always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.